Good evening. Welcome to the May 6th Town Council Workshop. This evening's workshop pertains to, um, well, actually, I'll let Tom introduce it. He can probably yeah. do better. <laughs> the, uh, the larger issue is something called small cell technology, but there is a specific proposal from Verizon Wireless Solutions regarding uh, two different facilities potentially on town-owned infrastructure. But we'd like to kind of start the conversation on a broader level, and I think Dan has perhaps some introductory comments. Uh, this council is still a bit fresh coming off a, a pretty major rewrite of your cell phone uh, ordinance, so-called. Um, and you might be able to talk about how this fits in that context first. Sure. Um, and I think most of the council was seated and working on this last fall, uh, but for I think Councilor Hayes and, and Baybine and as the rest of the council likely members as a very kind of in-depth, thorough update to allowing for um, enhanced wireless coverage, but in a, a pretty deliberate way, a pretty thoughtful way. Um, and the new ordinance that really hasn't been used much yet um, since its passage in the fall, um, as many councilors probably remember, there's a priority of location, there's preferences for the type of um, wireless antennas that are applied for and, and approved in town. Um, preferring that antennas be attached to existing towers if possible to improve coverage. If that's not a possibility, uh, site a new cell tower in our industrial zones where it's the most compatible from a land use standpoint. If this, that's not um, going to work for the coverage improvements, then consider what the ordinance calls telecommunication facilities, which are the antennas that are attached to buildings or structures that are more kind of stealth than a new tower. Um, which we think this technology kind of falls into that category. And then finally, the council allowed for uh, new cell towers more in our kind of some of our select rural areas where coverage was most lacking and, and based on study, um, coverage could be improved and there's very high standards for the acreage needed for that, et cetera. Um, so as now the new year's beginning and, and underway, there's more interest in um, moving forward with projects under this ordinance, and, and Chip and his group have approached uh, Tom and I um, with kind of a technology that wasn't really discussed during your process. Um, we did discuss the DAS um, technology, distributed antenna systems, which is, we covered that very thoroughly, um, where those are uh, antennas that are typically located on uh, utility poles and are connected together by wires. Um, and through discussion, the council decided to prohibit those in residential areas in particular, because um, there was concerns about compatibility and aesthetics and that type of thing. Um, this technology, and, and Chip is an expert in it and can explain the differences, um, is similar but, but different from that in that it's um, it doesn't have interconnections in terms of the wiring. It's, it's a different system, um, and they, in fact, aren't proposing them on utility poles, um, electrical transmission poles. Um, but again, they're similar technologies. Um, this proposal through Verizon is for a couple locations uh, in our, more of our commercial areas, one in Oak Hill and one up at um, the Cabela's area and they serve smaller areas in terms of enhanced coverage and data coverage. Um, Verizon's before you um, kind of pursuing a lease agreement with a town with maybe some potential to add additional ones subject to some type of town approval, whether it's council or, or Tom or, or others. Um, and that would only be the first step. They still would need to go through permitting. But they wouldn't be exempt from planning board and, and Verizon is the first carrier to approach the town, but there are there are others out there that are interested in talking to the town about kind of similar installations on other town infrastructure, whether it's a town building or another town, you know, structure like a light pole or, or something like that. So it seems like an emerging technology that can kind of serve smaller areas that um, they may approach the town um, in the future on. And um, if the town decides not to move forward with it, they probably can, you know, serve these areas in different ways with kind of private property owners, I imagine. But but Chip would expand on that. So 
I think that's a little introduction as to how the ordinance kind of fits into this proposal and um, turn it back to you, Jessica. Right. Or, uh, well, as I say, if you wouldn't mind just maybe explaining the difference between this technology versus what we've already kind of worked in. This is Chip. This is Phil Sox. Oh, yeah. production. Sure. <laughs> 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 I wonder why that's from, uh, from Freedom of Information uh, Act uh, yeah. 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 meeting we did. Let me point in the right direction. Uh, <laughs> one of the town attorneys from Bernstein Shore, Phil Sox here. I was looking at him going, I remember him. I didn't even remember him working for Verizon. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and I actually don't have much to add at this point. Dan, Dan just asked me to come along. Kate, you had some detailed questions came up about the ordinance. Um, I had reviewed it. I wasn't involved in the policy formation, obviously. But I, was, I reviewed it as you were as you were going through the process. Okay. More of a legal expert versus the white. <laughs> right. And again, the reason that we've encouraged uh, this to come to the council first, as opposed to going right to planning board or zoning board as may be required, is really because fundamentally yeah. they're proposing it on town infrastructure. So if that's not something we're interested in, we should give them that word sooner than later. So rather than putting everyone through that process and then deciding that we didn't want it at these locations, let's just go to that first. So that's really why we're here. I know. Uh, well, if we could just explain like, mm. be, where we've already recently had this issue, and I'm interested to hear him explain what the difference is. Thank you, folks. Again, Chip Fredette here on behalf of Verizon Wireless. Some of you may recognize me from our discussions in the last year and a half regarding the provision of the zoning ordinance. Um, that was, of course, done in part because uh, the land is somewhat antiquated and Verizon Wireless wanted to come in and provide uh, really a basic level uh, voice and data uh, connectivity to its subscribers in Scarborough. So east side of, uh, east side of the highway, south side of the highway, we have the, had fair, fairly good coverage, but as everyone knows, most folks on the west side of Scarborough, uh, coverage is really poor. So we were in front of you then talking about how, you know, like Dan mentioned, ways to revise the ordinance so that it works for everybody. Uh, and we believe that the ordinance that you have adopted uh, that's in place now will work for us. Um, we're discussing then again macro technology. Now there's this new technology that Verizon is taking really full steam ahead called small cell technology. And it's just that, they are small cells. So all, taking a step back, all of the carriers, as some of you may know, ha are licensed to operate certain bands. In, and that's like, those are county by county licenses. Um, Verizon Wireless has been operating on three of its four bands currently. There's a fourth band. It's a very high, high, t high frequency, 2200 megahertz, and they want to use that through its small cell technology. Okay? Uh, the higher the frequency band, uh, the weaker the signal, the, the doesn't travel as far, so it's, a, it's kind of a it's a it's a great match to use with this small cell technology. While we've got coverage along Route One, it's not enough. So the small te the purpose of the small te technology is to uh, to provide capacity, basically to provide demand or supply to the demand in areas that are uh, that are densely populated or or, or used heavily. Again, as they mentioned, we're talking about two proposals currently with the town. One is at Cabela's and then the other is over at, on Hannaford Drive for the supermarket. There are two other proposals, uh, that, or two other sites rather, that we're looking at along Route 1, but they're not on town property. Um, but regarding those two locations, the idea there is that when you have your smartphone and you're over in, in that area of town, I said in that parking lot, in that shopping center, or over at Hannaford, um, your phone will be is naturally pre-programmed to go to the strongest signal. So it would go to that, and by virtue of that, you take the load off of the site that you were currently getting, you were previously getting signal from, hence capacity. So you're at Hannaford, the phone sees the site on the light pole, and away we go. So that we relieve capacity on that site in the small cell. An efficient, easy way to provide additional coverage is doing its job. So it's not an appropriate technology to use, per se, in a residential in a, in a residential area like the west side of Scarborough. We've got a lot of trees, and you get, you get a higher uh, lot size out there, or you know, three to five acre lots spread out. It, it, it works better when you've got uh, less uh, less dense tree coverage, and you've got people there. And it's mall, outside of malls, downtown Portland, we've got. 40 or 50 plan for downtown Portland. 
Um, but it wouldn't, again, it wouldn't work on the west side of Scarborough, uh, which is why we are still pursuing some macro effects for the tower site. Again, this is a capacity, uh, a service intended to uh, serve capacity. Sure, if I could, what's the, uh, what's the coverage from that small site? Quarter mile. Quarter mile yeah. radius. All right. Well, um, does anybody have a, a question at this point? Ed. Um, one of the concerns that residents of the town had during the last ordinance change was having towers close to homes, uh, the threat of whatever kind of rays that cause cancer and so on and so forth. What's the threat with these? Even though they're micro, they're similar threats? No. no this None whatsoever? No. no. We, there, we're still required. We're still bound by the, the, the parameters the FCC set. So there's no more risk with a small cell than there is a macro site. You said there's no more risk, but no less risk? That's right. So it's the same. So if you have more of those repeaters, yeah. there's, there's more risk. No, 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 it's not. There's no. There's not. It's not a cumulative. Um, small cell. Take a Small cell is not a repeater. It's its own site, and that's the difference. Between, that's the essential difference between it and DAS. DAS is you've got one radio with a bunch of wires connecting antenna to antenna to antenna. Okay, uh, like in a stadium. We'll have one room on the first floor with those <coughs> radios in it, and then fiber connected throughout all the concourses with little antennas in the ceiling that look like Wi-Fi, and you'd never know the difference. That's that. Small cell is its own facility. It's one radio, um, a, a power panel, a cable, and an antenna. That's it. Uh, and it provides coverage to that area. So it, you wouldn't see Verizon Wireless place a small, uh, multiple small cells along Hanover Drive. You'd have to want to know how to do that. Kim Chip, I have a quick two questions. Sure. First one is, what are you mount mounting this on? So if you could answer that. Sure. So uh, on the screen there, I'm going to go to page two. And this is what we call uh, Scarborough Small Cell 1. This is the Cabela's parking, uh, parking lot location. And the location is actually out at the intersection. So. Here's the four intersection, Cabela Boulevard, top left of the page, of course, Payne Road running uh, north and south there. And on all four corners of that intersection, there are uh, traffic light poles. We've identified the uh, lower left-hand pole as the, as the target. And I'm going to go to the next page, and you'll see an elevation view yes. of that pole. So it's, so, on, so it's on the tra it's on the traffic signal. Yeah, it's on the top, top of the traffic pole. So my second question, and the attorney may want to chime in on this one, is because I worked really hard on this addendum to our ordinance, which is how is that not in violation of this, uh, the telecommunications should not be permitting to be put on distribution scale utility poles and structures, and how do you define distribution scale? utility poles and structures? Well, I think the way I look at this is that it's talking about utility transmission lines and it, utility poles and transmission lines. So a, a freestanding pole is not a transmission line. It's not connecting and transmitting. So the way I read your your policy here when you enacted this is you were talking about... Uh, I could argue with like, you both that interpret. You can always argue. <laughs> <laughs> you can always argue with the words. But um, it does use the word utility pool. And so we're, we're stuck with that word, and it uses distribution, um, it uses the word distribution. Distribution scale. scale. So utility that means, pools. okay. So the term utility pool itself is not defined in your ordinance, but I think utility facilities so is. So it's open to interpretation. Utility facilities is defined. And so, okay. I mean, the, okay. the closest we have, and that talks about things like transmission. I don't have that in front of me. And I right. printed it and I had it. But it talks about the transmission of things like data. Well, with uh, gas, I think that the pe people right. are concerned about And so at least system. the way I read it, this is not a transmission utility 
in, in, in the sense it's not transmitting anything like he's receiving, really right? It's just a standalone light bulb. Right? Yeah, but when you add you, when you add the cell thing, you're transmitting things that some people don't like. Right. And the intent, and when do you get into the intent of an ordinance? Also, as opposed to you know, you can you can play with words. That's all right. day, you know, as you know, legally, yeah. you know, words have different shades of meaning, right. and da, da 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 da. But the intent of this was to prevent things like this occurring in neighborhoods. Was the was right. the was the thought of it? Yeah. So I, I and I'm I I can just see it coming that you're gonna we're gonna have some opposition from folks who are gonna say this is the camel's nose under the tent. With allowing it in neighborhoods, so that's just I what would I encourage you. I, I, we've thought, I've tried to think of a similar circumstance in a residential area that's not a utility pole or a transmission line of some sort. I, I think, frankly, this didn't come up as I recall, and it might have been an oversight. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm just laying that out. But the residential application that. like this seems mm -hmm. far and few between, just mm -hmm. practically speaking. These sorts of facilities that aren't utility poles or transmission lines, in my way of thinking, virtually don't exist in residential areas. I mean, I it's just want to—I I just want to go on record though yep. that I have a concern about this, given what we went through with the cell phone ordinance, and then, I mean, and I was the person who brought forward this am amendment um, to the ordinance because of concerns from folks about having these transmitter, receivers, whatever, all over town. That's what it amounted to. My other, I'm sorry, can I ask one more question? While can you, before you leave that, though, yeah. uh, it's, it seemed all of that discussion centered around residential neighborhoods. And everyone who voted that night, I thought, was voting on the basis that we were restricting uh, DAS systems from residential uh, utility pools. That's at least what I understood. Yeah was the nature of it. Right, and, 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 and you, you... So that when you... But again, and so now we have this, so this is going to be another potential issue. That's all that I'm... The other part of your question is the other location. It's worth just putting it out there. Chip mentioned Cabela's, just so you can appreciate the Hannaford. Was that your second oh, I forgot question? what my second question was. <laughs> no, I know what it was. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, before I forget, because I'm getting old. Um, is... Uh, and, and again, this is probably more towards playing than towards chip, but so is this going to be open to AT&T and, and whatever, whatever, or is it going to be strictly Verizon? Because the intent, again, of our, our ordinance is to have as many co-locating as possible on these systems that go in. So Throw it out. Yeah, the requirement for co-location is on the macro sites, on cell tower sites. So as I understand, they're falling under the telecommunications facility definition, not yeah. the transmission okay. tower definition. Right. Um, so, and the reason they're <clears throat> before you guys tonight is that they are approaching the town to right. lease space on town infrastructure to do this. And I think that, depending on the, how the council feels, that's at least an opportunity for you guys to decide where you want to work, if you want to work with them, number one. Right. But if you do in some areas, you can decide where you want to lease town infrastructure. If there are maybe commercial areas, and perhaps you're more comfortable than residential areas, as Tom was suggesting. Mm -hmm. um, because the alternative is they could apply to just the zoning board and planning board and maybe get approved to mm -hmm. put one on the roof of Cabela's. Or, you know, a, a same right. installation just on a different building or structure in the same area. So right. in some ways it gives the council some kind of control as to where they Yeah, that would bypass the council entirely. Uh, so, right. so to that point, because yeah. I wasn't here, um, what prevents um, any uh, company going to Cabela's and asking to put it on top of their roof? If it, ordinance does not allow it, correct? Ordinance allows it. It allows it, yeah. yes. So they have to go to the planning board, and then in some zones, both the planning board okay. and the zoning board. Yeah. So uh, I have two questions. One is um, very aesthetic and minor. If you can go to the picture, um, I think it was an aerial view of the, um, so the question I have is what is the height and, and width of the actual um, cell um, that goes on top of the light right there, I believe. What is, 
Oh, so it goes in the back. Oh, that's a different that? picture. That's a very different picture. Yeah, okay, that's that, But that's nice to see. Different picture because it's a different, different location. Yes, but that's, that's um, that answers my question. Yeah. I don't need to uh, explain it. So the question I have is, what is the net benefit to the town to um, agree to this with Verizon versus AT&T, Sprint, or any other company? I don't know if there's a benefit from one company over the other. I think they're offering the lease revenue. Of the company. Yeah. Right. No, 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 I understand that. But uh, so, what, so what happens when another company comes forward, regardless of who they are, and wants to do the same? Are we going to have three, five, six right. of these on one pool? That's my. So point. what prevents us from, you know? I think structurally, and Chip knows better than I. I think one can be accommodated on this type of infrastructure, like a light yeah. pole or a traffic light pole. So that sort of the structure and its its um, integrity prevents more than one on one particular pole. I don't think anything prevents AT&T from coming to you and wanting to strike a deal on a different piece of town okay. infrastructure. And you're talking about the weight-bearing capacity of the pole? Is that the limiting factor for putting just one of these on a light pole? Is that? <laughs> it pulls the people weight and wind loading and physical mounting space. And if you look at this, look at this light pole. We've got our one one can antenna, as it's called, uh, it's ten inches in diameter by two feet tall. Uh, we've got one piece of cable coming down. We've got our radio on the left hand side and our meter on the right hand yeah. side. It, it's used up. If I were if I if I were AT and T and I came and saw Verizon, I wouldn't go for pole 1.1. I just go 100 feet down the road and go for pole 1.2. It'd serve the same thing, you know. Right. You're not going to see uh, somebody <coughs> ask for the space, same space on the same pole, or something like this. So, but just because I didn't get, uh, so what is? I'm still looking for what the net benefit is because if I compare this to, let's say, a utility pole. Um, my understanding, and I'm not a utility guy, but my understanding is that the poles are owned by CMP. Um, and then if anyone wishes to attach and wire, they rent space. Yeah. So the question I have is, so the net benefit of allowing that to another company for CMP is that they get some type of lease agreement and some type of economic benefit. Is there an economic benefit for us with that? Okay. We've not negotiated the terms, but okay. there would be a lease agreement and there would be an economic monthly benefit. or annual fees okay. associated with that. This is just kind that. of an opening discussion no, no, if I, we want to even yeah, look at it. I just want to make sure that <laughs> Just it's worth noting, you know, this Hannaford location, um, the reason our utility poles is that all the electric is underground, at least on Hannaford Drive. So right. There's no utility poles that exist. Yeah. If Verizon Wireless isn't able to come to terms at this location, at this pole, they could literally go probably 100 feet into the parking lot, which is mm -hmm. privately owned by yeah. Hannaford. Right. Assuming that it would work for their needs yeah. and negotiate their own deal, and we wouldn't have much to say. They would go through the same planning board and perhaps zoning board process, but it would bypass us altogether. So the benefit is lease revenue. Right. I just want to make sure that was out on the table for people on this. Can I add to that? The proposal, the proposal is really a master agreement with the town. Okay. Let's get to the legalese. Poise ourselves for future opportunities. This initial, you know, the town isn't locking itself into saying, "Oh, we have to give Verizon a lot of space." No, we'll still have to go through each individual property. We'll have its own site lease agreement. So the master is done in a way. We've, we've spent the money on on the attorneys. Now we move to individual site lease agreements. I contact Dan and Tom. Say, "Hey guys, you know, uh, we were looking at going into this section over here next to CMP's uh, antenna on the utility pole, but I understand your code doesn't allow for that. Instead, we'd like to go on top of the fire station." There's a possible third site, so on and so forth. So, in, in each each location, each site would have to pass muster with council or Tom, however you set it up, and then planning board or zoning board. I have a question before. Uh, <laughs> let me insert, and I'm not sure who's next. But, but then let me just insert one question. Um, one of my bigger questions was um, talk to me about the liability. Or, or if we incur any liability, one, if the pole falls, or for whatever reason, let's the light, you know, somebody hits the light pole and it falls down, does it become our responsibility to I mean, put I it back up? I think that's something that you can lease around. So I can't remember what, I've seen some the, the uh, proposed here, and we, and we haven't done much work on it yet because obviously they wanted mm -hmm. to talk about it. But there can be certain indemnities in there and that sort of thing. Um, I think you generally it's very put that kind of right now. Yeah. Uh, but there's certain there's certain concessions that we would certainly make. Yeah. Um, 
Does that make sense? Um, I guess so. So because you're in the driver's seat in terms of you know being the let's see here, okay. let's or I should say. So um, we, that's something that you could you ne could negotiate around. Negotiate. My my next question is along that same thought. So who, who bears ultimate responsibility if something happens to the coal? But my second question ties into that of what happens and who bears the responsibility if this thing no offense but falls off and hits a car or something, you know, yeah. who, who bears that responsibility? Well, again, I think from the town's perspective, we want to say that we don't have responsibility for that, right. and we make that clear in the lease, okay. um, and that's easy, yeah. I mean, that, that's something that we would just say that as part of the agreement to allow you to put it on the poll that we, you know, wait, you know, we, we don't take any responsibility for what may happen to that. Okay. I think it was you, Peter, first, but and then I thought I saw another well, hand, but, but we'll go Peter, with Peter, Peter first, and then somebody just, was on the side. I'm not sure if this is I think it was kind of, I think you kind of started the question. But if we agree with this with Verizon, I'm assuming this isn't an exclusive deal. So, there, you know, it's reasonable <coughs> to start to approach the town. But if we accept the deal with Verizon, does that then obligate us in some way by anything that's in this ordinance that we have to then allow all the others sort of an equal opportunity to be in the space? I don't see any. So you don't see any other. I mean, I think Once we open that door, that we don't. You would take each proposal on its own individual own. merit, right? And there'd be no precedent setting or anything that would. Other than the general rules related, you know, the federal <coughs> telecommunication rules, um, where you can't favor certain, you know. Which are outside completely of this phase of leasing. If you're a landowner, I contact you on <coughs> <our> property. <coughs> yes or no? If it's, you have complete, it's carte blanche. It's what you want to do. There's no right. set precedent. Only when you get into the permitting of it can it get fuzzy. That's yeah. right, yeah. Because I think the other thing I heard, the concern that was being talked about, one is concern about the, the radiation, that type of thing, and also just the aesthetics of having all of these mm. things all over town and all the corners and other things. So just that was yeah. the genesis of the question. Thank you. Uh, Dan, uh, just so that I think we all are reminded of what the ordinance allows and doesn't allow, uh, telecommunications facilities, uh, <coughs> and could you just talk about how they are allowed under our zoning and yeah. the uh, stealth aspect also? Because I think uh, it, it's been a while since we dealt sure. with it. Yeah, the, the way you structure the ordinance um, is you know, views and compatibility and kind of buffering were a very big component of what you reviewed. And that's why you started out by saying if there's existing towers up there, add to them. They're already up there on the landscape, et cetera. That's the first test. And then you decided that industrial zones, you know, adding new cell towers makes sense. They're already allowed in those zones. They're compatible with what's going on in those areas. And then you said, if those don't work, those are and those two things are defined as transmission towers. Those are the towers versus what we're talking about to fall under telecommunication facilities, which is the zoning term for these antennas that would be would go on a building or a structure like we're talking about this evening. Um, and under that category, if they're visible, like these would be, then they would be reviewed by. Um, the planning board in most commercial zones, because the planning board is used to reviewing aesthetics and development of commercial zones. It would also be in residential areas where there's more concern about compatibility and aesthetics. It would be reviewed by both the planning and the zoning board. So I kind of have belts and suspenders and additional review to make sure they fit in. Again, if they're visible, if they're stealth, meaning fully enclosed, you can't see them, and not altering the exterior of a building, then they don't need planning board or zoning board review. They go and apply to the code office for a permit, and they need to show how they're stealth, um, both the antenna as well as any ground-mounted equipment that has to be screened so that it's not visible and it's, there's not concerns about views and aesthetics and compatibility. Um, and then, I guess lastly, I mentioned at the beginning, is the, the last step is then, so if none of those work, you can go for the, the new cell tower um, in the overlay areas, which are those limited areas the council looked at and felt that they were 
really rural, low-density areas um, with a significant acreage requirement and setback requirement and a lot of standards for review to make sure that they fit into the landscape. So that's, of course, not this, but telecommunications facilities is So that's what we're why about. Uh, uh, telecommunications facilities can be put in church towers even though the, the church might be dead smack in the middle of a residential zone and there's no review of that whatsoever. Right. Just want to make sure everyone understood yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, under because federal law, there, there's no aesthetic impact, and we, by law, are not permitted to take into account health, health impacts. And if okay. that appears to be the basis of our, any portion of the basis of our decision, we subject ourselves to tremendous risk. Uh, so. Uh, that's that's how that gets resolved, and we need we just need to understand what the scope of what we're uh, what our authority is. Does this require us to go back and make changes to our ordinance? We're talking depends about on how you interpret the language. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I think that's okay because that's why I asked Jean Marie. Right. It, I would have said what I was voting for that night, and I voted for it, was that the, there weren't going to be these cans uh, of small cell technology in residential neighborhoods, visible, because of the aesthetic impact. Uh, that, and that was the argument that was made, because people realized that they, while there were many in the audience who were pressing this issue based on health, we ourselves were making the decision based on aesthetics. And that was what I said. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I thought I thought that was, if you're sort of saying, what's the legislative history of this thing, so as to interpret it, it was a residential point. And that's why I feel comfortable with this now. And the other component of it was that utility poles and utility lines were are clearly um, you know, they provide the network throughout all residential areas. They're kind of pervasive, obviously, um, and that was a concern. And the DAS technology is known to utilize that electrical infrastructure. I think that's why DAS was, was drafted kind of a, this way. It was kind of a pole to pole to pole right. with structures on the poles. Right. And so there was, as you sort of enter your way into a residential setting, it's all over the place. Whereas this is a single tower, hardwired, uh, and it covers a quarter, a quarter mile in all directions. So to answer my question, do we have to make any changes or not? I would have said no because I thought that this is not inconsistent with what I thought we voted on when we all voted. But I'm just concerned because it's a different technology. That's all. Yeah. So, I don't know. <laughs> any other questions? Sean. So, so what is the so this kind of goes into what is the next step, which is around do we need to change ordinance. Um, is this going to be a council action item in which we set the precedent and therefore it doesn't have to go to the planning board, or do we approve it or reject it and then it still goes to the planning board? I mean, what is yeah. the next step? Well, that was my next thing out to, to all, of, all of you guys. Um, what direction would you like to go? Um, certainly, you know, th th there's a either or. Either we're going to lease and, and direct the manager to start preparing some of those negotiations between, between the two, or we can send it back through the process of, of ordinance to, to craft language to include this. Um, I have my own personal thoughts about that, which I will add real quick. Um, I, I don't think this falls too far outside of the purview of that commercial. Uh, so for, for myself, personally, it doesn't make or break me to put, put this on the poles because as indicated, it can happen 50 feet from there on the private mm -hmm. property. So it's likely that this is coming. It's just do we want to be as the municipality, the, the folks that that make a little bit of money on it, or, or do we want to let the private sector make the money on it? So um, I, I personally don't have a preference either way, but I'm, I'm happy to, to support and direct, like I said, if we could direct Tom to go somewhere with it, it would be helpful. 
Is, is this meant to only be in commercial areas? Is that, is that what the yes. your agreement is? Strictly no, commercial? That's not, that's not how the lease is written. That's the intent of the that's the intent of the technology. It's intent it's intended to serve densely populated areas, shopping centers, beachfronts, uh, malls, that kind of thing. You're not I, again. I wouldn't. I would never picture us wanting to install one on Broad Turn Road. That's a macro site project, not a you know some small. I project. might add one last, and then then you myself personally, I I think it's a little more of a, you know, not that I want to rule the world, but I, I think control-wise we have better leverage in a contract agreement versus a broader, you know, o open ordinance of just put them up anywhere. I, I would myself prefer to have some kind of a detailed lease about where, where we're willing to have them and, and where we're not. Um, but That's sort of the point. Um, I was actually going to go down the same path about the details about where they are. Um, and so it's, to me it's about also um, maybe rather than an ordinance is whether or not the council should develop a policy regarding the uh, town manager's authority to be able to make a decision around so what if AT&T comes does it have to come back to the council every time and what are the standards for his consideration to approve a contract or for him to approve going forward we should have a a standard process that allows others to understand the decision process that we made today um, that guarantees that in that policy that, oh, this is, I mean, with all due respect, business climates change, and while you can tell me today that there is no intent, the business climate tomorrow might be, or in you know, five years, uh, we want to put it into a residential area. So, uh, you see what I'm saying? So I think that there needs to be a policy or something in place that sets into place or, into, you know, into stone what the standards are for consideration. and. For me, that allows the manager then to manage the issue going forward, so it doesn't have to come back to the council every time a new proposal comes forward. Could you give us a bit of an eye? I could see us authorizing the town manager to negotiate a master lease agreement, and that in it we would require that. Uh, none of the review processes presently called for by, by our ordinance be uh, preempted. They would all, so that if uh, the proposal is to put it in a particular zone that doesn't allow it, then it has to go both to the planning board for site plan review and the zoning board for a variance. Uh, and uh, that would Every, every, my expectation is that it would never meet the variance test. Uh, so it would always be true. Do you want to add that to the existing ordinance in the, is that what you're? I think it could be accomplished through a master lease agreement. Master lease. Yeah. And that, so that I mean, yeah. the master lease becomes policy. Okay. That's, right. that's what is approved by the council and that's what he has to use going forward. The, the other option is it, to arguably more, certainly more cumbersome is to deal with, for the council to deal with these on uh, on a case-by-case, site-by-site basis. And I don't have a sense whether we're going to be having dozens of these come forward or these are the two and we have, we, we don't hear another one, frankly. So uh, I don't have a good sense of that, but given the level of sensitivity and interest in the matter, I'm not sure unless we are able to articulate very clear guidance to the manager. Um, if I want that authority, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why you pay the big bucks, buddy? Oh, yeah. You could also uh, just suggest the master lease agreement, um, which would be you know silent in terms of location, but have that negotiated, and then each each time it comes forward in this proposed location, that could be then brought to the council for, and you know so it wouldn't be town decision at that point, but he could get the master lease agreement. Uh, together. Yeah, it's not that I'm if fearful of making a decision. I think right. by bringing it to no, council, it exposes right. it right. to a, a larger audience. Um, you know, affairs well, happening in my office yeah. aren't necessarily yeah. public. Not that I'm trying to keep them private, but right. these affairs are televised. So sure, that sounds. I'm, I'm kind of looking around the room, thinking we have a, a head note on that. Yeah. Um, that there's a master agreement, and as the individual projects come up, we come to council. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Is there anything else anybody would maybe like to add at this point? So and with that direction, what would come back to you is that master lease, and, yeah. and it will address the issues of liability, identification, lease revenue, all those sorts of yeah. things. Um, so we'll come back to you for you know a more in-depth conversation on the particulars. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. For your you. And we will Thank start you. at seven dollars.